Suzuki GSXR 1000. A motorcycle that has redefined what a modern sport bike should be. GSXR is a is an institution. But before Suzuki could build its first bike, the company had to totally reinvent itself. A hundred years ago, Suzuki made the best weaving rooms in the world. I had no idea myself. I mean, I thought they made motorcycles. Today, they're famous for motorcycles. But a century ago, they were famous for machines that made cloth. You have to have cloth, and uh, I guess back in the day, there was quite a market for it. Suzuki looms were precision machines used to create intricate fabrics, and today, that precision continues on their motorcycle production line. It's amazing to me how quick they can uh, assemble an engine. I could never understand how they got everything organized so it all went together like that. I mean, who, who organized all that stuff? Why did the Suzuki Loom Company go out of business? And how did a loom company reinvent itself as a motorcycle manufacturer that would bring racing to the masses? Hamamatsu, Japan, a city few tourists visit, even though it's only 150 miles south of Tokyo. Hamamatsu was one of Japan's major industrial centers, and most Westerners arriving in Hamamatsu are here on business. For many years, it was the center of Japan's fabric industry. Today, Hamamatsu is home to the Suzuki Motor Corporation. With a population of 600,000, Hamamatsu is a far cry from the small seacoast village it was back in 1909. The year Michio Suzuki founded the Suzuki Loom Company. As a child, Michio Suzuki had watched his mother and other women in his village laboriously weave fabric by hand. He grew up vowing to create a machine that could make the work easier. And he did. By 1929, Michio Suzuki had been awarded more than 120 patents for inventing an entirely new type of mechanical weaving machine. Suzuki looms were so good that the company survived the destruction of World War II and actually prospered in post-war Japan. Until I got a little bit older in life and started and started appreciating uh, uh, things from a different perspective, I had no idea myself. I mean, I thought they made motorcycles, and that was it, you know. For nearly 50 years, Suzuki looms were the best money could buy, and they were sold all over the world. But in 1951, Michio Suzuki would be blindsided by a global cotton market collapse. the world's best loom maker faced financial disaster. What Michio Suzuki did next was as ingenious as any loom he'd ever created. In 1952, at the age of 64, Michio Suzuki set his sights on a new mechanical device, reinventing himself and his company in the process industrial company with a lot of uh, a lot of smart technology for the time and um, just a lot of uh, 
a lot of business sense back in the day. Interesting that they were able to morph that loom company and that technology into something that would benefit Japan's population post-war. Post-war Japan needed cheap transportation. Michio Suzuki, the man who had pioneered every major development in Japan's loom industry, used his technical genius to invent a motorized bicycle. He called it the Power Free. Remarkably, every piece on the Power Free was designed and built by Suzuki. And they built all their loom products themselves and didn't outsource any of that. Uh, and it would make sense that they would continue that with their bike business. Power Free was really the world's first true moped. It had a unique gear system that gave riders three choices. Pedal it as a bicycle. Let the tiny engine help power you along. Or stop pedaling and ride on engine power alone. The two-stroke engine takes over when you need to go up hills or do some distance and uh... Just to, it's interesting to see that, that that part of the market has really kind of stayed the same. I mean, a, a current Pook moped is kind of just what Suzuki was building back in the day, really. And, uh, and that's 1952, so that's quite a few years ago. The Power Free was such an ingenious device, the Japanese government gave Michio Suzuki money to research motorcycle engineering. of the Suzuki Loom Company was over, but the Suzuki Motor Corporation was born. Reinvention became the new mantra of the Suzuki mindset. In 1953, Suzuki created a new Power Free, giving it a 60cc engine that cranked out two horsepower. In its very first year of production, the Power Free won the Mount Fuji Hill Climb, one of Japan's most prestigious road races. Like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, Suzuki had changed itself yet again. Now, it was a company that not only created practical means of transportation, but a company that lived to go racing. DNA of the Suzuki is a uh sportiness and the race. In 1954, Suzuki invented the Kolita, its first true motorcycle. Two years later, in 1956, they retooled their design, giving the Kolita a larger two-cylinder engine. By 1959, it was time for Suzuki to test themselves and their machines against the best Japan had to offer. So they took the Kolita racing. Four riders and 11 mechanics spent three months living in a wooden shack on Mount Asama, testing their bikes for the famous Mount Asama Volcano Race. In the late 50s in Japan, there were over 200 companies building motorcycles. They were responding to the growing demand of Japan for reliable two-wheel transportation. Each company was trying to prove to the public that their machines were the best. Whoever won the 14-lap, 131-kilometer Mount Asama races would hold a sizable advantage. Our motorcycle's image is, uh, first of all, sportiness, and also good handling. So it comes from the motorcycle race uh, experience. Three of the five bikes that Suzuki entered in the 1959 Mount Asama race broke down, and only one machine actually crossed the finish line. But for one lap, just one lap, Suzuki was king. In five minutes and 50 seconds, the little Kolita recorded the fastest lap among all competitors at the race. 
Even though they didn't win, Suzuki had served notice that they were ready to take the next step. Now, their challenge was to build fast bikes that could go the distance. Win. And if you win, then people understand your product. And it's, it's you know, it's simple. As the 60s dawned, Suzuki would reinvent its racing bikes with help from an unexpected source, a German racer and designer named Ernst Degner. In 1961, Degner and his family escaped from East Berlin hidden in the trunk of a car. Just a few weeks later, Suzuki management met Degner at the Swedish Grand Prix and hired him on the spot. They wanted Degner's help in gaining exposure for their bikes in the West. They hoped his experience would help Suzuki win what was then the most important motorcycle race in the world. The Isle of Man TT. We started international business with a motorcycle from uh, racing of Isles of Man. So uh, for Suzuki, race is uh, core. In 1962, with Degner riding a motorcycle he helped design, Suzuki won the Isle of Man. Knowing that demand for new motorcycles was growing both in the U.S. and Europe, Suzuki decided to take what it had learned from racing and reinvent its next motorcycle. All right, let's rev it up a notch. This car just goes bang, right? They own the street. This Gorgeous, man. Hell yeah! They own Texas. Hey, Richard! Get you some of this! <laughs> Everybody's missing the most important thing here. Can you believe it? The Misfit Garage, tonight at 9 on D-Max. It's the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. It is the worst tattoo I've ever seen. I hate it. I lost a bet. May look like a male body part. A wiener. <laughs> I need to fix it or rip off my leg. I just want it gone. I need to get this covered up. You have a new tattoo. America's Worst Tattoos. Sunday nights at 10.40 on D-Max. In just 13 years, Suzuki had gone from weaving to winning. From a tiny moped to the world's fastest 250cc machine. In 1965, Suzuki built the T20. It was a bike aimed directly at the US market. T20 had a two-stroke engine, the same type of engine used in old lawnmowers or chainsaws. Two strokes burn a mixture of gasoline and oil. They make a lot of power, but they're loud and smoke pours from their exhaust pipes. The T20 was a big motorcycle. It was known here in the States as the X6 Hustler. It was a, a real jump for Suzuki. It was a 250cc two-stroke twin, fast, handled well. But that bike was a good race bike. Um, it was a good street bike. It kind of showed where Suzuki was going in terms of two-stroke stuff. By 1968, Suzuki had doubled the size of its engine to 500 cc's, the largest two-cycle engine in any motorcycle of its day. Called the T500, the new bike could top 110 miles an hour. In 1976, Suzuki introduced the GS750, and that really was um, kind of the next big superbike. Once more, Suzuki had reinvented itself. Only this time, the company's reinvention foreshadowed the era of the modern sport bike. The 
GS750 was the company's first four-stroke engine design. Four strokes are like modern automobile engines. They only burn gasoline, and they make less noise and less pollution. Suzuki's reinvention is interesting. Uh, I, I especially like the part where they went from two strokes to four strokes, because that was a big jump for them. But boy, they sure pulled it off, and they pulled it off right away. There wasn't a big learning curve for them. In 1982, Suzuki engineers began work on a new 750cc motorcycle that would change the motorcycle landscape forever. In 1985, Suzuki shocked the motorcycle world when they introduced the all-new GSXR 750. We had the GS750 in our lineup. We added the R, which stands for racing. The GSXR models were born on the racetrack. They were designed to be fast, agile, cutting edge machines. The four strokes were GS. And then X was, I believe, you know, like sort of experimental, you know, and R is for racing. So, you know, the initial GSXR of 1985, that was like a race bike, you know, it was like an endurance race bike. It had lights, it just rolled off the bull door or off Le Mans, and here it was. It was not only a breakthrough model, but a breakout machine. The GSXR 750 weighed 104 pounds less than the bike it replaced. Almost overnight, Suzuki had redefined the modern sport bike. That level of performance when that bike came out, instilled in the sport bike market, that I think has made the entire industry elevate to the level that it's at right now. At that time, racing motorcycles had many features not seen on street bikes, such as full fairings, aluminum frames, and very powerful brakes. In racing trim, the new GSXR 750 produced 130 horsepower. It had a high-tech engine that was narrower than previous models and used magnesium to keep the weight down. The, the, the watchword there was lightweight. That thing, they pared it down, aluminum frame, uh, air-cooled engine, so it had no heavy liquid cooling on it. They made the wheels light. They worked on lightening up every piece on it, and it was, it was an extremely light bike. <laughs> The GSXR 750 was an immediate success on the racetrack, but not just any racetrack. In 1985, the same year the bike was introduced, three French riders, Bernard Millet, Guy Bortin, and Philippe Gouchon, teamed up to ride the all-new machine to victory at the legendary 24 Hours of Le Mans endurance race. The win in France set the stage for Suzuki's breakthrough moment in America. In 1988, the GSXR 750 won the Daytona 200 with a young Texan named Kevin Schwantz on board. The new GSXR 750 was the perfect bike for Schwantz. I think uh, an aspiring 22, 23-year-old kid um, who's out to try and prove to the world that he can road race a motorcycle and uh, a great new sport bike like the Suzuki GSXR just couldn't help but be a great, a great pairing. In 1986, Suzuki put the GSXR 750 on steroids with the GSXR 1100. It was not a reinvention of the sport bike, more like a big brother to the 750. Some people decided to do their own inventing, adding turbochargers and fuel injection to the 1100. That bike went 234 miles an hour with me on it, and that, that's a GSXR to me, something that can be built, leaned on, and deliver the goods. A 234, back in those days, it was, it was it, nobody could believe it. It was incredibly uh, exciting. The GSXR 750 was still the bike to beat on both the track and the street. But moving into the 1990s, Suzuki would need a lighter, faster, and more powerful motorcycle if they wanted to continue to compete. 
So what did they do? They decided to reinvent the GSXR. At the beginning of the 1990s, the Suzuki Motor Corporation was at a crossroads. The company had reinvented itself countless times, but now a fierce argument raged inside their own corporate headquarters in Hamamatsu, Japan. Should the company build a so-called middleweight sport bike? A motorcycle with a smaller 600cc engine? Traditionally, middleweight sport bikes got customers into showrooms, but didn't make much money. They were just kind of a, a kind of a lost leader for a lot of the companies. Eventually, there was a consensus. In 1992, Suzuki introduced a new model called the GSXR 600. With a 600cc engine, it had a smaller motor than the GSXR 750, but smaller didn't have to mean slower. People may not remember the GSX-R600 was the first truly trick 600 to come along. 600s, 600s were always kind of uh, dulled down. They didn't have adjustable suspension. They might not have had uh, this and that and the other. They didn't have the trick foot pegs. They were just kind of a, uh, kind of a lost leader for a lot of the companies. But uh, Suzuki decided, let's put adjustable suspension on the 600, and they really led the charge with the GSX-R600. The original GSX-R600 led to an entirely new model line that emphasized more power and less weight. So you get on a 600 and you have this thing that's lighter, it's revvier, it feels easier to change direction on, and it, it just seems a little more human size, you know? If you've ridden one, it, it, it's like you're dancing with it. I mean, it's that kind of a partner. It's, it's what, what do you want to do now? Let's do that. The GSX-R600 is called a middleweight sport bike. And while it received great reviews, Suzuki was intent on winning the heavyweight crown. To do that would require another reinvention of the GSX-R. In 2001, Suzuki made the long-rumored secret public. It showed the world the GSX-R 1000, a motorcycle that had been under development for three years. A lot of people really don't know what goes into the building of a motorcycle. They think the parts just appear and they put them together, and, but there is just so much R&D behind each part of a motorcycle. Um, it takes a couple years to really do a bike from scratch. The first GSX-R1000 was an instant game changer. The bike had a 988cc engine that produced an astonishing 160 horsepower and offered Ferrari-like performance for a fraction of the price. On the seat, uh, when you ride it, you can't believe it's a thousand. I mean, you can believe it's a thousand when the throttle's open because it, it's shocking. It's shocking how far it accelerates. But mid corner, it feels small under you. It wants to turn. It wants to change direction mid corner if you need to. It'll tighten up its line. From 2000 to 2008, Suzuki's GSX-R1000 has won the American Motorcycle Association Racing Championship for an unprecedented eight out of nine years. We think that the AMA race is the most precious and also most important uh, race in the United States. So we are always concentrate to the AMA race. GSX-R is, is an institution. It brought racing to the masses. Race bike with lights, truly for sale. 
at a price that you can actually afford, you could go buy. I mean, it's just amazing. To describe the GSX-R1000, it, 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 words don't do it justice. You need to watch someone like Matt Maladner ride the thing and see, to see that they can do just about anything on it faster than anybody in the nation. has been so successful in the GSX-R1000 that fans not only expect him to win, they expect him to dominate every race. Nowadays, winning's not enough, you know, because we've been doing it so much. Everyone's like, oh, if you only win by five seconds, it's like, okay, what's going on, you know, so. Some of the most intense pressure on Maladin to win comes from Maladin himself. Coming second isn't um, a great result, and being on the podium is not a great result, but winning is a great result. The GSX-R line of motorcycles has been very, very good. There's no doubt about that. This is where winning or losing begins. The Takasuka engine plant in Hamamatsu, Japan. The engine plant is part of a complex the size of 52 football fields. This is where the heart and soul of every Suzuki motorcycle is built. Including the 163 horsepower engine of the GSX-R1000. During peak production, the engine line runs day and night. 962 workers assembling 1,800 engines a day. That translates into 700,000 engines a year. Surprisingly, building the engine is done by hand. There are no robots or automation. It is a mix of new technology with classic engine construction new high-tech equipment, and there's also some old equipment. Um, there's a lot of handwork, uh, engine assembly. There are 24 different stations along the engine assembly line. There is little wasted motion. At each station, workers perform several different tasks in just three to four minutes. It's amazing to me how quick they can uh, assemble an engine, put it together, get it to tolerances. From start to finish, it takes just over one hour to build a new GSX-R1000 engine. The organization in the place was what got me. Just so many things going on, yet everything was in place, everything was in line, and that's the Japanese way of doing things too, you know. They, these guys have got it together, there's no doubt about that. The final step on the engine assembly line is a compression test. It almost sounds like the engine's running, but it's not. An electric motor is spinning the engine, and what sounds like an exhaust system is really the sound of a pressure gauge measuring the airflow inside the new engine. 30 miles away from the engine plant is Suzuki's Toyokawa final assembly facility in Aichi, Japan. If you've ever ridden a Suzuki motorcycle, this is where it was built. Final assembly may sound simple, but it's not. There are more than 330 different components that must be put together to build just one GSX-R1000. The first step, is the frame. Five cast aluminum pieces held in a jig are welded together by a robot. It's about the only automation used in the entire factory. From here, virtually everything will be done by hand. Next step, welding the GSXR's unique two-part fuel tank. Most motorcycle tanks use three pieces. With only two pieces, the Suzuki process is quicker and the finished tank shows less welded seams. Every new tank is then pressurized with air, flipped upside down, and submerged into a water-filled tub. They're looking for air bubbles, which would indicate the tank was leaking. 
After the tank and other body parts are painted, it's time to apply the GSXR graphics. Every single one is done by hand. There are no bubbles or scratches in the artwork. And if you've ever tried to put on a sticker without getting any air bubbles, you know just how difficult that is. Near the middle of the final assembly line, hydraulic arms pick up each chassis and turn it over. A small lift brings the engine to the line and experienced hands swing it into the frame and bolt it down. The entire engine installation process takes less than one minute. I could almost set up camp in the factory and live there and just watch what goes on because to me it's just amazing the way the bikes get built and just all, total organized chaos. The speed and efficiency of the whole factory is amazing. To me, it's, you know, it's almost as amazing as watching a, a race bike going around, going around a racetrack. To, to, to watch those guys, you know, 10 or 15 seconds at a time, know exactly what they got to do, put engine bolts in, da 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 da, -da get everything in place. It's, uh, it's kind of like a finely tuned machine. It's, you know, it's a lot like a race bike. As the frame and engine move down the line, sub-assemblies are added, including forks, wheels, brakes, and clutch levers. Body panels are fitted. Another new GSX-R1000 is almost done. Standing there and watching it roll on the line, and it was nothing, and roll off one a few minutes later, a built motorcycle, and just the guys, you know, you see them building it, next station, building it, building it, building it. Each finished bike is pushed off the assembly line onto what they call a rolling road. The engine is fired up for the first time and run through the gears. The bike is connected to a dynonometer, or dyno for short, that measures engine performance and power. There's always a run of guys, they come on, they get on, they, they take it up to this like little dyno, start up, brr, 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 yeah, so okay. off the dyno, brr, around the corner, disappeared. The next minute the guy comes running back and he's on the next one, brr, 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 you know, it's like every 30 seconds, like, oh my God, this guy could run marathons, I swear, all day, it's just amazing. When the test ends, a technician rides the bike across the factory to the shipping area. The first time this new GSXR 1000 has ever been ridden as a real motorcycle. At the loading dock, the new bikes are placed inside metal packing frames, bolted down and covered with cardboard boxes. They're quickly loaded into waiting big rigs. The truck engine's left running to avoid wasting time. By the end of 2007, 873,000 GSXRs have been shipped all over the world. This is where every GSXR has been designed and tested. Suzuki's research and development compound in Ruyo, 30 miles outside of Hamamatsu, Japan. We are in the Suzuki Proving Ground. Uh, this is a very home of Suzuki motorcycle. And uh, basically, outside people cannot come in. Again. Suzuki discourages photographs of the complex, but it did open the door of its engine test center. First time I walked into it, I kind of walked in and went, you know, and I, I think that was a quite nice way of putting it. it. It looks worked in, it looks used, it looks like that's where people go and, and do work to try and develop things. The GSXR engine was developed and tested here. Here's our engine bench test room.
With the engine bolted down to a test stand, computers measure RPM, water temperatures, and fuel and air mixtures. In another part of the building, they run a second series of tests called chassis simulations. Now, the engine is installed in a completed motorcycle. This facility is for checking our you know, drivability and uh, you know, running the simulation much more real than uh, engine bench. And uh, we can check our more realistic uh, engine feeling. I was always intrigued by how, how much testing and how, much, how many man hours of engineering and thought and testing go into one motorcycle. Suzuki saves the most difficult test for last, and it takes place on one of the most difficult test tracks in the world. The Ruyo R&D complex includes a four-mile long track. Two of its seven corners are 120-mile-an-hour sweepers. This is where the company test riders push each new model to the limit. They got bikes on the track. They come in, they pull things apart, they put stuff in, they send the test rider back out again, lap and lap and lap, come back in, change another part, put it out. That racetrack and that part of Suzuki is where a lot of the racing stuff starts. The track has one of the longest straightaways in the world, one and a half miles of asphalt that ends in a blind high-speed right turn. You miss the turn, and you crash into the woods. Incredibly dangerous track. I mean, walls everywhere, incredibly high speed, the back straight, and you're tapped in sixth gear, like you're looking at your watch. It's just, it's so far. It's so far away. You don't know where the corner is down at the end. It's pretty hard to sit there at 175 miles an hour, but, uh... Anyway, that, that test track is just it's pretty much of a shocking thing. It's a pretty amazing experience to know that Kevin Schwantz tested all his GP bikes there, and it was a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful feeling to be able to be where you know that all the performance Suzuki motorcycles have sort of got their first real run, you know, in, in the real world. The new GSXR 1000 spent months on the Ruyo test track. Finally, in 2001, the bike was put into production. Since then, many of the GSXRs have ended up in the United States on roads made famous by Hollywood movie stars. Malibu, California is 5,592 miles away from Hamamatsu, Japan. It is home to both surfers and celebrities. But what makes Malibu truly special isn't the coastline. It's the mountains that rise up from the shore and the canyon roads that carve their way through the mountains. It's the lean as I go through the corners. I'm not much interested in going in straight lines along the interstates, but I do love going uh, leaning through the corners in the Malibu Canyon. The Malibu Canyons are among some of the best motorcycle roads in America. the perfect place to discover just how much fun it is to ride a Suzuki GSX-R. For me, sport bikes are the most enjoyable motorcycles to ride. You feel yourself cutting through the wind. You feel that you are one with the bike.
latest models of the GSX-R600 and GSX-R1000 are the fourth generation of each bike. Suzuki reinvents the model line every other year. The thing that amazes me about Suzuki's GSX-R1000 is how incredibly capable it is, how powerful it is, how fast you can go, and how little effort it takes. It's not easy exactly. I mean, you have to pay attention. You've got a 163 horsepower motorcycle that weighs 430 pounds ready to ride. does all the things you want of a sport bike. It allows you to make mistakes as a rider, which we all do, we're human beings, and then recover for you. It's really good looking, <laughs> it's a gorgeous motorcycle. It's just very purposeful. Ergonomically, it's not a mess. I mean, you can ride the thing all day if you need to. Uh, maybe if you're a little bit younger, but you can ride the thing all day, it's, 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 it works that way. And when you do show up at the racetrack, it goes well. Each new generation gets faster and lighter. The newest GSX-R600 continues the tradition started by the first one. They're built as race bikes and then modified to ride on the street. Boy, lately, last few years, last five, six years, the 600 has, has been tuned up and, and it's right at the front. The GSX-R600 outsells every other sport bike in America, 20,000 bikes a year. The class is a huge performance bargain. Compared to the GSX-R1000, the 600 is smaller and easier to ride. But you get on a 600, and they're not as intimidating because they don't have that kind of torque where you just crack the throttle, you're at the edge of traction, everything's on the edge, and you're getting ready to come out, and you give it a little bit of throttle. Well, they don't have the torque on the bottom that would go bang and make that tire go, whoa, what's that? Since 1985, nearly one million GSXRs have been sold around the world. Every one of them, a race bike built for the street. Suzuki, they've got such a long history with that kind of motorcycle and they've been building it for the rider for so long and refining it through racing and, and everything that you get. To, they work with you, you know. To me, it's, it's neat to know that what's happening here at the racetrack is actually, we're seeing it. I mean, it, it may not be next year, it may not be five years from now, but it eventually ends up in production motorcycles. Both the GSX-R600 and the GSX-R1000 use onboard computers developed for racing to change how much power the engine makes. Our latest technological challenge was adopting another feature developed for our race bikes for use on our street bikes. It's called a drive mode selector, and it allows riders to change the power characteristics of the engine to suit different riding conditions. With a flick of a switch, riders can change throttle response, full, medium, or low power, depending on road and weather conditions. That's what modern technology should be, something that helps riders enjoy themselves. A speed and all that stuff, that's not such the issue. It's the, the fact that you're going to go home on the same vehicle you arrived in. In other words, you're not going home in the ambulance, is what I'm saying. And that's what those settings, those, those settings work out well for that. GSX-Rs use state-of-the-art technology, but the basic concept of the bikes is simple. It's all about having fun. They are built to give riders the joy of a lightweight, fast, and easy handling machine with cutting-edge technology. Obviously, on the street, I can't get the same thrill as what I get on the racetrack, OK? Um, but the attraction for me riding on the street is just the group time, you know, hanging out with your mates, going to have a coffee or going to do whatever. I mean, I, I really, really enjoy doing that. The 
GSX-R1000 combines everything Suzuki has learned from nearly a half century of racing. In racing, we talk tenths of a second improvements, right? A tenth here or a tenth there. Those tenths of a second add up. The latest GSX-R1000 is not much slower than a full-out race bike. Multi, multi-millions of dollars being spent on prototype motorcycles, yet the production-based GSX R1000, anybody can go and get that motorbike for very little amount of money, is only about three seconds a lap slower. I mean, it's nothing. So the GP bike goes flying across the finish line, and then one, two, three. There goes the street bike. The Suzuki story is unlike any other in the motorcycle world. It began with a young man's simple desire to make it easier for his mother to weave cloth. That man, Michio Suzuki, would prove to be a mechanical genius who invented the world's best looms. And then, facing financial disaster, he found a way to reinvent both himself and his company. I definitely think Suzuki is a company that's reinvented itself over and over and over and to really, really amazing success. Reinvention would become the hallmark of Suzuki motorcycles and the reason Suzuki continues to redefine what a modern sport bike should be. I rode a motorcycle when I was three, a few months after I started riding it, you know, maybe some gas was spilled on it or whatever, and it caught on fire. I remember my dad chasing me with a bucket of water, throw, you know, throwing it on the bike, and, you know, and I'm jumping off the bike and all this sort of stuff, and, and uh, my mum thinking, oh, you know, maybe that might slow him down, but as soon as I got the fire out, I was back on again, the seat was burnt, you know, and I was back, let's go again, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So little bits and pieces like that stand out. 